An interesting example of that to make it concrete would be to consider the uh, really gorgeous uh, light, light emitting organs at the tips of the tentacles of a kind of a squid that lives off the coast of Hawaii. These, these light organs on the tips of the, of the uh, squid um, can't develop without colonization by a very particular kind of bacterium at a very particular time in the development of the squid. So it's a two species performance that allows the functioning adult organ to develop. Turns out that, that um, the uh, structure of our gut has that same quality, that absent colonization by the proper bacteria at the proper time, uh, the lining of our gut can't develop uh, either correct structure or function. Now these, these are, in a sense, isolated biological stories, but for me they are paradigmatic of the processes of co-constitution, which I regard as normal and ordinary uh, parts of being in the world. We've learned about co-constitution and performativity and other such matters in the human sciences. I think what I'm suggesting to you is that these patterns of thinking the world are happening across domains of intellectual work these days in quite generative ways, and that they allow us a narrative space for thinking about cohabiting this planet with uh, ontologically heterogeneous others in ways that I regard as somewhat less lethal than some of the narrative patterns that we might have already known all too well. So, I've spent a great deal of time talk, thinking about the notion of species in my work. And the, the title of this manifesto is, of course, the Companion Species Manifesto. And I, I think I owe you an account of where the term comes from. But the first thing I would like to tell you is that the, the term companion animal in uh, Anglophone, in U.S. English, um, is very recent. It, in fact, it dates from roughly the mid to late 1970s and comes out of the former land-grant colleges where the vet veterinarian schools are housed and where departments of psych uh, psychology and sociology in alliance with medical schools and veterinary schools are housed and is a term, companion animal, that emerges to replace the notion of pet, the category of pet, uh, where uh, dogs but also other animals come to be used uh, in such things as increasing the survival rate of heart attack uh, and heart surgery patients or lowering blood pressure or improving the response of patients to chemotherapy, or helping children survive child sexual abuse, or working with autistic children and adults. Dogs enter into therapeutic relationships in a range of ways uh, that get categorized in, these, in the literature, in the scientific literature, psychological literature coming out of these former land-grant colleges and universities, University of Pennsylvania, for example, University of California at Davis, um, these sorts of institutions that continue to serve the techno-scientific apparatus of the nation uh, the term companion animal uh, originally referred to these therapy animals. It was, it was a particular kind of labor processes that these animals were engaged in as part of medical practice. We might consider this yet another example of de-skilling in the HMO system. Uh, it's like a lot of volunteer labor, I'm sure they aren't paid, uh, but I'm not going to go there. Uh, <laughs> okay. Companion animal then becomes generalized uh, in the efflorescence of um, companion animal culture uh, in across really across the world, it's not just Western countries by any means. In Japan, for example, um, where it's relatively difficult to keep dogs in cities, although lots of people do, it, it's somewhat less frequent than it is in most Western cities, uh, kids who want to go out on a date can go to a park and rent a dog uh, to go with them. It's a very high status and desirable thing to do. And there are quite a number of dogs who are trained to sort of mediate the date. Uh, I, I have the literature for this. There's a park where you have to stay on your date with your dog, your rented dog. Uh, there are any number of, of uh, sort of new labor practices, shall we call them, uh, that have proliferated around the world um, as uh, dogs and other animals become more and more and more closely associated uh, with people living in densely technoscientifically inflected cultures. I think why becomes a really interesting kind of question. What's going on? Um, this is a multi, you know, in the United States alone, dogs alone are a multi-billion dollar industry. There's almost nothing you can't buy uh, for your dog, from uh, natural food industries to alternative uh, acupuncture. Angela Davis, my colleague, who I assure you, her both her feminist and Marxist credentials are in order, uh, <laughs> uh, bought for her Asian dog who had some rear end paralysis trouble, this really lovely wheelchair, this kind of back end part, yeah. so she and her dog could go walking properly. Uh, she's considerably more off the deep end around dogs than I am, uh, which gives me some uh, courage <laughs> to carry on this mode of critical theory. Uh, in, 
the uh, tradition of uh, Adorno and Horkheimer. <laughs> so, um, species is a word, uh, I told you about companion animal, but I would like to suggest to you that companion species is very much bigger than companion animal. And I would like to uh, advance that the cyborg is indeed an occupant of the category companion species, though it's not a companion animal. The companion species leaves the question of the ontological companion open. And that certainly machines of various sorts can be companions in quite intimate ways. It's not only Sherry Turkle who knows that. Uh, that the specificity of the modes of intimacy deserve uh, a detailed inquiry. One would be ill-advised to generalize from one mode of companionship to another. But nonetheless, the co-constitutive relationality of companion species, I believe, to be a rather general matter. Okay. But however, in relation to companion animal, uh, companion animals as companion species, I have the following things to say. First, as a dutiful daughter of Darwin, I insist on the tones of the history of evolutionary biology, with its categories of population, rates of gene flow, variation, selection, and biological species. The debates in the last 150 years about whether the category species denotes a real biological entity or merely figures a convenient taxonomic box sound the over and undertones. Species is about biological kind, and scientific expertise is necessary to that kind of reality. Post-cyborg, however, what counts as biological kind troubles previous categories of organism. The machinic and the textual are internal to the organic and vice versa in irreversible ways. That's not news. Second, schooled by Thomas Aquinas and other Aristotelians, I remain alert to species as generic philosophical kind and category. Species is about defining difference rooted in polyvocal fugues of doctrines of cause. Third, my soul indelibly marked by a Catholic formation, I hear in species the doctrine of the real presence under both species, bread and wine, the transubstantiated signs of the flesh. Species is about the corporeal join of the material and the semiotic in ways unacceptable to the secular Protestant sensibilities of the American Academy and to most versions of the human science of semiotics. Fourth, converted by, Mar by Marx and Freud and a sucker for dubious etymologies, I hear in species filthy lucre, species gold, shit, filth, and wealth. In Love's Body, Norman O. Brown taught me about the join of Marx and Freud in shit and gold, in primitive scat and civilized metal, in species. I met this join again in the modern U.S. dog culture with its exuberant commodity culture, its vibrant practices of love and desire, its structures that tie together the state, civil society, and the liberal individual, for example, in the off -leash dog park, and its mongrel technologies of purebred subject and object making. As I glove my hand in the plastic film, courtesy of the research empires of industrial chemistry that protects my morning New York Times to pick up the microcosmic ecosystems called scat produced anew each day by my dog, I find Cooper Scoopers quite a joke. One that lands me back in the histories of the incarnation, political economy, technoscience, and biology. In sum, companion species is about a four-part composition in which co-constitution, finitude, impurity, historicity, and complexity are what is. Now, I don't have time to do a great deal with my love stories and my training stories, my face-to-face -face time. But I do want to do a little bit with love stories and training stories. And I will need my research assistant in order to proceed any further. It's only because I've already warned you against can I not feel like narcissism that I risk this picture of this infant. Uh, she was actually an infant at this moment. Uh, this is, this is uh, Ms. Kyan Pepper, a puppy who was growing, who is at this moment learning to be my research assistant in this project. I'm going to tell you uh, some training stories, and to do that I will take yet another brief entry from Notes of a Sports Writer's Daughter. Marco, my godson, is Kyan's god kid. She is his god dog. We are a fictive kin group in training. Perhaps our family coat of arms would take its motto from the Berkeley Canine Literary Politics and Arts magazine that is modeled after the barb, namely the bark, whose masthead reads, Dog is my co-pilot. 